message, not just the speaking, but the hearing. Lord, so in that, we thank you. We yield now to your work in our lives individually. In Jesus' name, amen. New book this morning. Uh, Paul's epistle to the church at Ephesus. The letter, the book of, people call it different things, but Ephesians. The Apostle Paul was an interesting guy. He had uh, gone about the Roman Empire prior to his conversion to Christ, persecuting Christians. Uh, he had received letters from Jerusalem, from the elders, the, the leaders there to go, and, and was actually authorized to arrest Christians, to persecute them. Uh, we see him standing by holding the cloaks of the men who stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7. As he was converted to Christ on the road to Damascus one day, on his way there to round up more people in, that believed in this thing called the way, Look at that a little this morning. It was the early name for the church. Uh, God knocked him off his horse, blinded him. And, and he didn't say Saul. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, which is a little northwest of Israel. Uh, and, and his name was Saul at that time. A highly educated man. Roman citizen, Jewish citizen, is, citizen of Israel, had dual citizenship. Uh, but a fascinating man. He had been highly, highly educated by a, a guy by the name of Gamaliel. Uh, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. In Philippians chapter 3, if you're a note taker, you could read all about his life, his former life in Judaism there. So as he was commissioned to this apostolic ministry that God gave him, he made three trips, three journeys. They, you may have heard people talk about Paul's missionary journeys. Well, the first one, it was a short journey. He started in Antioch, Syria. There were two Antiochs, uh, one in Asia Minor, one in Syria. And he started out in Antioch. He went to the island of Cyprus, which is in the, the eastern Mediterranean. And then he got onto the land. He went to these three remote outposts called Lystra, Iconium, and Derbe, and then he went back to Antioch. That was his first journey. On his second journey, he went a lot further. Where the book of Ephesians comes in is on that second journey, he plants the church. On his third journey, the church explodes. And, and I, I mean in a good way. It, it was an amazing, amazing time in the first century. We're going to look at Ephesians this morning. We're going to go through, we're going to actually get to one verse. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, and then I'm going to reteach that verse next week. So uh, I just want you guys to understand that we've got some places to go here as we lay the groundwork for this wonderful, powerful letter called Ephesians. The, the book was written in about 60 or 61, uh, about 30 years or so after uh, Christ had been crucified, a little less than that. Uh, it was written at about the same time as Paul wrote uh, Colossians and Philemon. Uh, he sent all three letters to these were, and Colossians was to the church at Colossae, and Philemon was to an individual. But he sent all three letters by a guy by the name of Tychicus, and, and he was accompanied by another guy by the name of Onesimus. And just bless your heart with that. But they, these guys, they didn't have mail. So they had to have people that were committed to delivering the message, and these were the guys that did it. God had raised them up to be able to disseminate these letters to the places where they were intended to go. So, uh, as I mentioned, it was written by Paul the Apostle. It was written from Rome, all right? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go along, but it, it was written by Paul during his first Roman imprisonment. He was imprisoned twice. The first time was house arrest. He lived in a rented house for two years, and he was chained to a Roman guard. And, and it, it was, it's interesting because the guards kept giving their lives to Christ and converting to Christianity because you're chained to the Apostle Paul. Things are going to happen. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it, during that time, uh, if you want to read about that, it's in Acts chapter 28. But he wasn't yet in the Mamertine prison, okay? The Mamertine prison was where he was imprisoned on death row and where he would be executed. I stood in the Mamertine prison one day when I was visiting Rome, 
And, and it was just, and the, the apostle Peter was held there too before he was crucified upside down out on the steps of the, the forum there. And, and it was just an interesting, interesting place. Uh, hole in the ceiling, hole in the floor. The Tiber River used to run closer than it does now, a couple thousand years ago, changes course. Uh, and what they would do is they would fill this room with condemned prisoners and then they would open the hole in the top, let the Tiber River in, drown them all. And when everybody was dead, they would pack this thing with, with condemned guys. They would open the hole in the bottom and wash their bodies out in the river. That's how they did mass executions back then. But Paul was different. Uh, oh, I could just go on that the rest of the time. He was different, and so they made an example out of him because this thing called the way, again, the church, the Christian church, Christianity was taking hold, and I don't mean a little bit, and Rome was very threatened by that, and he was identified, rightfully so, as a leader of the early church. So, interesting, it, it, it's, this is one of four prison epistles. Uh, he writes, uh, let's see, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, these were also letters that he wrote while he was there under house arrest in Rome. Uh, interesting, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, and 4, verse 1, he identifies himself as a prisoner, but he never says, I'm a prisoner of Rome. I, I love that, and, there's, and we'll get to it when we study that. He says, I'm a pr prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. He knew that it was God's will that he be there for that time because God was working his purposes through it. In verse 1, we're told that the letter was written to two groups. Uh, interesting, he says, to the saints who are in Ephesus, so to the Ephesian church, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. You and I are part of that second group. Obviously, we're not part of the church at Ephesus. It doesn't exist. Ephesus doesn't exist. It's interesting. Um, where this book is placed in the scripture is, it, it is the second of the minor epistles. Epistle means letter, by the way. Uh, if you look at the New Testament, the way that it's put together is Ma Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are the, the four gospels. Uh, and then there's the book of Acts, where we're going to spend a lot of time this morning, which is the Acts of the Apostles. It's the things that happened in the early church after Christ had risen and as, after he had ascended, the book of Acts, it begins with him ascending into heaven, giving the great commission, go to the uttermost parts of the earth and share this gospel. And so uh, it, it, as we look at where this is, the major epistles of Paul are Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And the reason why they're called majors is because they're longer books. It's kind of like we've been looking at the, New, or the Old Testament study where there's major prophets and minor prophets. It's not like they're short guys. It, it, it's, it's that they're short letters. And, and so these minor epistles are not minor in doctrine or in weight. This is one of the weightiest letters. Some call it the weightiest letter in the New Testament. And it's only six chapters long. But so it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, First and Second Corinthians, Romans. Those are the, the major epistles of Paul. He wrote 13 letters. 14 if you count Hebrews, but I'm not, I went there last week. So, but the point is, is that after that, he goes into Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then he goes into the T's, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and, and then it gets into Hebrews and all that. So one of the ways that I learned this, what is our power company's name? You guys know? Portland General Electric. Right. Okay, you want to understand the order, the beginning order of these minor epistles in the New Testament. Just think of General Electric Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. All right? It'll help. So when you're trying to locate them, okay, where was that? He, he said turn to Colossians. Oh, oh then you can actually impress people with that. So um, <laughs> anyway... So it's a letter about the church. That, that's what Ephesians is. It's a letter written about the Christian church to the, that church specifically, but it's also a written letter that's written to the church. It's not just about the church. We can't afford to take a distant view of this and think, well, this was something for them because this is something for us. 
And the application in here is great. Uh, a tremendous amount of application. We'll see next week that Paul hits the ground running. He goes into, it's called the doxology. It, it's a form of worship that he starts the letter with after his introduction. And it's the longest sentence in all of the Bible, perhaps in literature, I mean, it goes from verse 3 to verse 14, and he covers the entire uh, Trinity, the, the three persons of, of the, the Trinity. He, he goes into the work of the Son and the work of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, and it's all there in one sentence. So uh, we'll save that for next week. But Part of the way that this book breaks down, I'm going to break it down in a couple of ways here, is he describes the church in three ways in this letter. The first is he describes it as a body. That's why we call the church the body of Christ. And he uses metaphorically the human body. There's the head. He's the head. And then there are the parts. We're the parts, and we have different functions and roles in the body. We'll get into that. The, the next thing he does... In, in, verse, or in chapter 2, uh, he talks about the church being a building, that we're built up. Uh, and that's in, in 2, 19 through 22. And then he talks about the church being a bride, because the church is called the bride of Christ, that we are his bride. Uh, I really look forward to talking about that. There are two major divisions in the book, and I want you to understand this is very key. Uh, there is the wealth and the walk, all right? The, the first three chapters describe the wealth that we have as Christians, and, and it, it goes into our inheritance. In chapter 1, verse 7, he says, according to the riches of his grace. One eleven, he says, we have obtained an inheritance. One fourteen. He talks about the pledge of our inheritance. 118, the riches of the glory of his inheritance. 27, the surpassing riches of his grace. 38, the unfathomable riches of his grace. And 316, the riches of his glory. So these first three chapters are all about what we get. What does the package look like? When I give my life to Christ, when I let the weight of my life down on him, when I have him as Lord and Savior in my life, in my heart, what is the transaction that takes place? He defines that in chapter 2. And, and what is the inheritance that I, what do I get? And, and the riches that we have, folks, are amazing. We're going to look at those in detail, and, and we're going to sort of take them apart and look at them. And my prayer is that you'll be blessed because many, many Christians walk around in this life without really apprehending or taking hold of that which Christ laid hold of us for. And that is, he, he is there are great blessings in that. The, the, the last three chapters describe the walk of the Christian. You can't walk in, in, in a right manner unless you understand what you have. It's the result of the understanding that he brings in the first three chapters is the result of the way that we walk. He gives five exhortations. Looked at that last week. Exhort an exhortation is a strong encouragement. Uh, five exhortations on how to walk. Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Chapter 4, verse 17, he says, walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. Now, Understand that Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles, and if you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. That's kind of how that breaks down. Uh, there were the Jews. The gospel initially went to the Jews, and because the Jews rejected it, the gospel of Christ went to the Gentiles, to the rest of the world. So it, and what he's talking about there is he's saying, don't walk as the Gentiles. Don't walk like the world. Don't look like the world. Uh, chapter 5, verse 2, he, he exhorts to walk in love. Chapter 5, verse 8, he says, walk as children of light. And then in verse 15 of the same chapter, he says, be careful how you walk. We're going to get into all of those. In chapter 6, he switches it up a little bit. He doesn't talk about walking, but he talks about standing firm. Three times in chapter 6. In verse 11, he says, stand firm against the schemes of the devil. 
And in 13 and 14 of chapter 6, again, he exhorts to stand firm. So as we look at that, we look at these, three, these two different divisions in the book, there's great symmetry here. Uh, I came across a chart. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, I started thinking after I finished all of my slides and stuff that I, I should have made a graphic out of this. But I'll just go through this. The first three chapters talk about spiritual wealth. The second three, chapters 4 through 6, talk about our spiritual walk. The first three, the position of the believer. The second three, the practice of the believer. The first three, God sees us in Christ. The last three, the world sees Christ in us. The first three are are doctrinal. The last three, chapters four through six, are practical. The first three talk about Christian blessings, what we get. The last three talk about Christian behavior. The first three talk about the finished work of Christ. The last three talk about the faithful walk of the Christian. The first three, the work of Christ in us. The last three, the work of Christ through us. We in Christ, and then Christ in us. Who you are in Christ, in the first three, and then in the last three, whose you are in Christ. Finally, uh, identity, who we are in Christ, and then responsibility. Going forward here, chapter 1, verse 1, we read, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. So as I mentioned, Paul planted this church on his second missionary journey in Acts chapter 18. And I'm going to summarize here because I want to cover a lot of ground this morning. Paul is at Corinth and he's teaching there. He had in Acts, if you trace it out, on his second missionary journey, he's going across the top of Asia Minor. He's going by land. Uh, he's, He's at Philippi. You look in 16 in Acts 16. He's at Philippi and he's got, you know, he's there and he gets arrested and beaten with rods. He and Silas and they get thrown into jail and there's an earthquake that night and and they're in there singing praises and the doors open and the jailer can't figure out why they didn't leave and his whole household gets saved and all that. Well, the guys come the next morning, they realize he was a Roman citizen. They said, uh, because he, you had different rights as a Roman citizen than you did as a Jew. I mean, one is captor, one is captive. <laughs> and so... Uh, they realized he was a Roman citizen and they really shouldn't have treated him the way that they did. And so they essentially, I'm paraphrasing, came to him the next morning and said, pretty please, would you leave? <laughs> and he said, well, I don't know about that. And he kind of took him on about it. Well, he ends up getting, taking off and leaving. He goes from there, has a couple stops along the way, and he goes from there to Thessalonica. That's where we get the word Thessalonians, the people at Thessalonica. He goes over there, a couple hundred miles to uh, the west, And the Jews chase him from Philippi, and they stir up trouble there. And so he goes to this place called Berea, which is, we talk about the Bereans, be like the Bereans. It's where that's from, Acts 16 and 17. And so he goes from there to Berea, and and they chase him there. And these guys come at night, and they put Paul in a basket, and they cart him a couple of hundreds, 250 miles or whatever it is, down to Athens. He goes from there That's when he goes up onto Mars Hill and he gives that famous deal in Acts 17 where he talks about the statue to the unknown God and he he really addresses the the Athenians on their turf talking about their pantheon of gods and let me tell you about the unknown one and all of that. Well, he doesn't get chased out of Athens and and I have some opinions about that I don't want to take the time to go into. And he goes from there to Corinth. While he's at Corinth... uh, He meets these people whose name were Priscilla and Aquila. Aquila and he were, they had in common, they were tent makers. And so they are working and getting the church going in Corinth, which is about 50 miles from Athens. And so they're doing the work there. And and while they're there, Silas and Timothy drop down and they join them at Corinth. Now, Paul knows that he wants to go to the feast at Jerusalem, so he knows he has to get back home. He is way far away. He's way on the other side of Greece at this point, and he wants to get back to Jerusalem. And so he leaves Silas and Timothy at Corinth to manage the church there, and he heads to Antioch in Syria with Priscilla and Aquila. But he decides to make a stop along the way, 
and he stops at this town called Ephesus. Uh, and there, as was his custom, if you look through the book of Acts when he's on these journeys, he lands in town and he heads straight to the synagogue. He wants to start reasoning with these people from the Bible, from the Old Testament, and he would talk about, and he would bring Christ out as he taught. So he goes to the, the synagogue there, and the Jews are impressed. They, they're, wow, this guy's speaking some powerful stuff. And they say, would you please stay for a while? He says, no, I really can't. I've got to get to Jerusalem. I've got to get there before the feast. But I'm going to leave Priscilla and Aquila, and God willing, I'll come back. So he heads for Jerusalem at that point. But what had happened there in Ephesus is that was the birth of the Ephesian church, all right, in Acts chapter 18. He gets this thing planted. He can't stay. He's got an agenda, but he leaves faithful people there Priscilla and Aquila, now they should have been in Rome, but they were displaced because Emperor Claudius, he had kicked all the Jews out of Rome and they ended up in Corinth. That's how, in God's design of things, I mean, God's always working ahead. We talk about that. He was working ahead of these people and they ended up being the people that were there for that time to go with Paul, to go to Ephesus. And it doesn't say, it says they headed for Antioch and they stopped in Ephesus. Maybe they wanted to gas up. I don't know what they were doing. But the point is, is that in God's providence, these people stayed, and they nurtured the church as they went. So I want to talk about Ephesus here for a little bit. It was, this, is, this is a major city, all right? Many people, when they think about this and they read these, these epistles, they, they, they think, well, you know, it's a little town, a little whistle stop that he kind of pulled into and decided to share Christ, and a few people came to the Lord. That's not so. This is a city of at least a quarter million people. This is like one and a half times the size of Salem, all right? Just to get a little bit of context, uh, it was established about 10 centuries before Christ. It was the second largest city in Asia Minor. It, it was a huge place. It was a seaport on the Mediterranean Sea, and it was a hub for trade. It was a financial center uh, for Asia Minor. In, in a sense, if you look at Washington, D.C. is the political center of the United States. If you look at New York, it's the financial center. Ephesus was a wealthy, wealthy city. And, and so as Rome was to their world, the political center, Ephesus was a financial center. It was sort of like a New York in the first century, that, in that era. So understand that it played a major role in the empire. I've got a slide here for Asia Minor. It shows where Ephesus is. On, on the, the eastern banks of the Aegean Sea. If you look at the kind of greenish area to the left there, that's Greece, all right? Athens would be under the inset map down below. Uh, and if you look at the inset map, it shows where this area is located as relates to the planet, all right? Now, I want you to notice something else. Ephesus is in large type with a large little bullet next to it. But these other cities that are there... This is a very small area. If you go from Pergamon to the, the north to Laodicea to the southeast, it's about 150 miles between those two cities. This is not a big area. These are the seven churches that the Apostle John writes to when he received the revelation of Christ in his glory, the apocalypse. When we look at the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches that are there are these seven churches and they're packed into this little tiny area. And so Ephesus being the biggest city of all of them, a major seaport, a major center. Uh, let's go to the next slide to the Mediterranean area. You can see here in the upper left, there's Rome, the, the, the piece of land that looks like a boot. That's Italy and Rome there. Now you can look down sort of to the center on the left is Corinth, and right in the center is Athens, and then from there, Ephesus. Looking down to the right at the top, there's Antioch, that's in Syria, and then you can see where Jerusalem is. This is just so you get an idea of the geography of where we're talking about for this book. You guys know me, I like to locate these things in real time, in real space, because it's important that we understand these are not just fun Bible stories, these are real places that really existed, 
and real people and real events. I mean, we believe that, and I absolutely believe that the Bible is inerrant, accurate, and it's backed up by archaeology. We'll look at a little bit of that this morning as well. So the other thing about Ephesus is that it was a, it was a, it was a stronghold of Satan. It was a center of pagan worship and magical arts, sorcery, was rampant. I mean, the people there were immersed in, in, in the dark arts of the Greek-Roman world. And there was uh, some interesting things going on. They had no less than 24 pagan deities that these people worshipped. And it was a mix-and-match type of deal. You guys ever heard of the word syncretism? I want to tell you what that means because it's alive and well today and it's something to guard ourselves over. What they would do is take the aspects of one form of religion and mix them with another and come up with a new one, kind of a hybrid, all right? When Israel came out of Egypt and Moses went up on the mountain and they decided to make a cow, which was an Egyptian deity, they called it Yahweh and they tried to mix that with what God was doing, the syncretism. When Constantine in the 4th century nationalized the Christian church, no longer was the church to be persecuted, but now it was nationalized by Rome, he mixed in a whole lot of paganism, all right? Uh, and I'm not here to make doctrines about Christmas trees and Easter bunnies, but they are part of the syncretistic aspect of what happened to Christianity back then. These People were all about fertility. I mean, they're an agrarian society, and, and their society was built on having a good crop or not. And, and so as that was the case, they became syncretistic. They mixed religions. Israel's history was filled with going and setting up altars on the high places in the Old Testament where they would mix Judaism with the worship of Baal or the worship of the Asherah or the worship of Molech and so on and so on. And they would mix these different ideologies. And what you end up with really is a mess. And so here comes the Apostle Paul to this boiling pot of pagan garbage. And he's sent by God and he comes and he plants this church. Interesting, interesting time. There, what they had, uh, one of the biggest deals they had was, it was called the Temple of Artemis. Uh, that was the, the Greek word. The Roman term was the Temple of Diana. All right. Uh, I have an artist rendition here of this, t this temple. This is one of the, you guys have ever heard of the seven wonders of the world? This is one of them. Uh, the Temple of Diana was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This thing was 450 feet long, 225 feet wide, 60 feet high at the columns, had no less than 127 columns inside and out. You, you guys have probably seen pictures of the Parthenon in Greece. This is four times the size. All right, This is a big building and it had lots of worshipers. Uh, it was the oldest marble temple that was ever built. And, and this temple was built three times. It was built about eight centuries before Christ and then attacked and ravaged, torn down. It was then rebuilt in 550 B.C., the second building of it. The third was about 323 B.C. when it was rebuilt again. Diana was a mythological goddess of the hunt and wild animals. But she was also, even though she had no children... She was also considered to be a fertility goddess. And that was where the hundreds, there would have been hundreds of temple prostitutes that were part of this whole deal in Ephesus. And, and sex and sexuality, aberrant sexual practices were part and parcel to their worship and to the way that they did things, magical arts, sorcerers, divination, oh, the whole deal. It was all part of this soup that Paul and Priscilla and Aquila stepped into when they came to bring the light of the gospel of Christ. By the way, what the temple of Diana looks like now, <laughs> there's, there, there's one column left. It was damaged and destroyed about 300 years after Christ uh, by the Goths 
And, and I read that and I thought, was that a bunch of guys in black trench coats that like heavy metal music? No, I don't think so. But it was destroyed by the Goths. Uh, and, and, but Constantine, again, talk about syncretism. Constantine repurposed the temple for Christianity. Hey, let's put a hat on it. <laughs> It reminds me of, you know, when I was in Rome uh, at the center of St. Peter's Square, at the center of the Catholic Church, they have this huge Egyptian obelisk. looks like the Washington Monument, but it's shorter. And, and it's got the Eye of Ra on it. I mean, I'm serious. I, I, I'm looking at this. I'm standing there, and this is like the center of what they call the Universal Church. And here's the Eye of Ra, and somebody a few centuries after they stole it from Egypt plastered a bronze cross on the top. Syncretism. Be careful. It's around. I'll tell you what, folks, part of what we're committed to here is preserving the purity of the doctrine, preserving the purity of God's word. And we are not going to depart from it. Uh, you guys have heard me say before, not on my watch. We are just not going to. This is, this is God's word. And you don't mess with it. You don't play with it. You don't bring in weird doctrines. You don't try to make the church look like the world for a greater appeal. That's a huge mistake, and I see people doing it. But it's like Joshua in chapter 24. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. In Acts chapter 18, uh, finishing up in verses 22 and 23 in Acts uh, 18 here, he says, and when he had landed at Caesarea, this is the Apostle Paul, he has taken off now. He left Priscilla and Aquila at Ephesus, and he, he took off and he sailed all the way to Caesarea. Now, there are two Caesareas in Israel. This is Caesarea Maritima. Caesarea Philippi is where it's up on the flanks of Mount Hermas where Jesus was in, in Matthew 16 when he says, who do men say that I am? And, and Peter says those famous words, you're the son of the living God and all of that. That's not that Caesarea. This is one on the sea coast. And, and this is a city that, it, that Herod had built. Beautiful, beautiful city. Actually, it stretched out into the Mediterranean. He did these amazing engineering marvels. Anyway, he lands there which is a little bit north of Joppa, which is now Tel Aviv, and he heads for Jerusalem. So it says, when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went to the feast, as he had told the Ephesians. He went down to Antioch. And I was looking at the thought, down to Antioch? Antioch is like 100 and some miles to the north. How would he go down to Antioch? You'd think he'd go up to Antioch. And then I realized, these guys didn't have maps. <laughs> Jerusalem is up in the mountains. Anywhere from Jerusalem is down. And so he's, and to me, it just adds to the veracity of the word. Because, yeah, he went down to Antioch. Antioch is near the coast. It's right there uh, in the coastal lowlands on the, the northern end of the Mediterranean there. So he goes down, and after he spent some time in Antioch, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia. That's where he was from. Or well, actually, next door, Cilicia. And Phrygia, in order, strengthening the disciples. Now, this begins his third missionary journey. He is now taken back off. He landed at Caesarea. He went up to Jerusalem, and then he went down to Antioch. And now he's going by land back to the west and going on his next journey and he's strengthening these churches that he had previously planted along the way. All right? He goes to Philippi. He goes to Thessalonica. He goes to Berea. He doesn't go to Athens again, but he goes down to Corinth. Now, the rest of chapter 18 talks about this guy named Apollos and he shows up, a uh, highly educated man, had a, a basic knowledge of Christianity, was a believer, but he needed to get kind of sharpened up. And so Priscilla and Aquila kind of disciple him. And he is a gifted man. And he gets sent off back. He ends up back in Corinth. So in Acts chapter 19, we're going to go through for the rest of our time this morning, I want to spend time in Acts 19 because this is the, the history of the Ephesian church. This is what happened that got this thing kick-started. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, that's from Antioch through the upper regions by land, now he comes to Ephesus. That's Galatia and Phrygia and all that. And he'd kept his promise. He had told these people right before he left, God willing, I'll be back. And now he's back. 
And finding some, some disciples, verse 2, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. So essentially these people, he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they say, Holy who? What are you talking about, Paul? But what's interesting is they're called disciples. And I think that Luke would have made a distinction if they were disciples of somebody else. They had enough faith to believe, to trust Christ, but that faith was not well developed at this point because they really hadn't had the opportunity to be taught. Remember, they didn't have the New Testament at this time. These guys are living it out, and it's being created as they travel. So they were students of Jesus, uh, and yet they didn't know much at all about what he had done for them or for us, uh, especially that his promise was to send the Holy Spirit when he ascended into heaven. I remember the, the church where uh, I was at for many years, uh, gosh, almost 20, uh, at Calvary Chapel in Northern California, uh, it started with a guy by the name of Bob Henderson. He, he was my pastor for decades, a wonderful brother, and my dad in the Lord and all. But, excuse me, it's, he, it started with a Bible study in a living room, and it was a living room full of a bunch of people who were neighbors, and they had gotten a hold of these cassette tapes from Pastor Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. And they're getting together every week and they're listening to these tapes. None of them are saved. They have no idea. They're kind of like these guys. They, they're like, wow, you know, this is good stuff. And, and a pastor from an Assembly of God church in a neighboring city heard about this Bible study with a bunch of unbelievers at it. And they don't have any leadership. They don't know the gospel. They don't understand. And he goes up and he leads the whole group, the whole room to Christ. That was the birth of that church. It, it, I just was reminded of that as I'm looking at Ephesians here. It, 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 in my own history and, and seeing back, uh, and that church is going today 45 years later, and uh, it's a great ministry. My son is still on the board there. He's an elder there, and um, my brother is in ministry there and all that. At any rate, verse 3, it says, And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? And they said to him, Into John's baptism. Ah, okay, well, this is it's as far as they had gone. So Paul says, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So two different baptisms here. John's baptism was to prepare the way. It looked forward to the coming of Messiah. The baptism that we have is the result of or follows conversion. We're baptized into his death, the Bible tells us, and raised to newness of life. That couldn't happen with John's baptism. It could only happen through the finished work of Christ, which, when John was here, hadn't happened yet. So there were distinct baptisms, distinct purposes for each. John's prepared the way for Messiah, and ours is a response to the work that he's done in our lives. Verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In another place says they were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're not going to get hung up and think, well, this is one way. There is some weird doc Jesus only doctrine out there that kind of uses this verse. I don't want to go there. Uh, Anyway, so when Paul, verse 6, had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Here's a quote that I came across, and I think it's a good one. I, I think often, because there's so much abuse out there regarding the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that people don't avail themselves of the power that's a there, that's available. And yeah, we're not into wackadoodle stuff here. I mean, it, you're, this, it, I don't want to go there. <laughs> Again, I'll get sidetracked and we won't finish <laughs> on time at all. But the point is, Availing ourselves of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is very important. He exists as our helper. He exists to come alongside. He exists to empower us. He exists to anoint us for the work of the ministry. He is a multifaceted ministry. And I think, again, Christians can fall short. Here's a quote I came across. God always wants us to go deeper. We tend to sip where we could drink deeply. We tend to drink deeply where we could wade in, and we wade in where we could plunge in and swim. Most of us need to be encouraged to go deeper and further into the things of the Holy Spirit. The bottom line, folks, is we need to be teachable, to allow the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, to instruct us as to his ways, to manifest in our lives, to yield to his work. 
Verse 7. Now, the men were about 12 in all. So this isn't a big group. I mean, you're talking a city of at least a quarter of a million, and he's got 12 guys that go, uh, what Holy Spirit? I don't know. And so he ministers to them. They fully step in. They begin to uh, manifest the, the empowering, the gifts of the Holy Spirit right away. And, and so he goes on in verse 8, and he went into the synagogue. Again, every time you look at Paul on these journeys, he heads for church. All right, the church hadn't been founded yet, but he would head to their version, which was a synagogue. There was a system of synagogues in Judaism by this time. It wasn't something that God put together, but man had put together to make it easier for people to gather. They didn't have to go to temple all the time, so they did synagogues. The point is, it was a gathering place. Uh, and so Paul would go and reason and persuade concerning the things of the kingdom of God. He used the Old Testament he spoke from the Old Testament scriptures, and the Holy Spirit, again, was the teacher. The Spirit of God is being poured out on these people in increasing measure, uh, and a full-blown revival is about to break out. Interesting, when you talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote First and Second Corinthians, those two letters that we have in the New Testament, during his stay at Ephesus. And First Corinthians has a lot to say about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. That's for another study. Verse 9, but when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way, again, that's the, the term they used for the early church, uh, before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples. So he said, okay, we're running into opposition here at the synagogue. These guys are starting to turn other people against us. This isn't working for me. It's not working for you. Let's leave. It says that they were reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. I have a friend whose church's name is Tyrannus. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So the ministry in Ephesus at this point is expanding. God is using these people. Again, he uses the adversity they ran into at the synagogue to move them to this school. And we don't know much about the school other than it must have been a school that was able to house enough people that the word of God was getting into people and then getting out and getting out of the city and out around Asia. Uh, at the end of the chapter, we're not going to go into it, but the guys actually complain and say, most of the people in Asia are hearing about this Jesus guy and, and you know, we're we're kind of put off by it. It says that he continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Interesting. Timothy would become the pastor at the church at Ephesus. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he wrote to him at Ephesus to strengthen him in his leadership. Timothy's parents, one was a Jew, one was a Greek. He was perfectly suited. He wasn't the pastor yet. He's still over in Corinth. But God, again, working ahead, working these things out, is raising Timothy up to come from Corinth to Ephesus because it was a center for both Jews and Greeks. As I mentioned, we don't know a lot about the school of Tyrannus except that Paul went from one day a week, Shabbat, Saturday, the Sabbath, in the synagogue, that's when it was open, to six days a week and for hours at a time. He started a Bible school. This is like a first century seminary. He has got students now and they're gathering and he's got this thing going and these people are coming and they're getting turned on to the gospel and they're getting fired up and they're going out. So you, you have this whole thing from the mild persecution they got from the Jews that he moves to the school and the thing just starts to go crazy. I mean, the people are being reached and the word is going out all over the region. There was no way that he by himself could have done this. But again, God getting a hold of this man's life, using him to influence others who would influence others and continue to carry that out. That's part of how the church has been communicated for 2,000 years. Yes, it's absolutely by his spirit and through his word. And yes, the gospel is communicated from one person to the next, and that's how it gets out. 
In verse 11, there's some, uh, it says that God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. This, it's interesting. He said that they were unusual miracles. These were not common miracles. He didn't just walk up to somebody and say, here's my handkerchief. But that was happening with these people because God in his sovereignty understood what, it, what was needed to reach these people. This reminds me a lot uh, of Exodus chapter 7. Remember Aaron's rod? Pharaoh had his magicians and sorcerers and you know, all of that. They came and they started throwing down their rods and the rods became snakes. And, and God told Aaron, throw down your rod. And it became a snake and it ate the other ones. All right? Part of why I believe, and this is, I'm into interpretation here, but part of why I believe these unusual miracles were taking place is this is a dark, dark place. And these people had been steeped in the magic arts, in sorcery, in in all the weirdness that went with that. And God is showing them, look, the true God can truly do miracles. These aren't just things that you carry around on trinkets. I mean, we'll talk about the the guy... uh, that he made silver shrines of the temple of Diana. It's like, what do you put that on your dashboard? I'm, I don't understand. But, but what God's doing here is he's responding to where these people are at with their dark, godless, satanic, spiritualistic practices. He's demonstrating superiority over them. So... In verse uh, 13, he says, Now, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves, emphasized took it upon themselves, to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. <laughs> I just, things are getting a little weird here. Um, I would like to have seen this. You know, these guys, are, they're getting up there, and essentially what they're doing is they're saying abracadabra. You know, they're thinking that it's sort of like Simon the Magician in Acts chapter 8 when he said, let me buy some of that power. That's some cool stuff. I want, I want some of that. And these guys are seeing the miracles, the true miracles that are happening. They're not just talking about miracles now. They're happening. These guys are watching them in front of them happen. Verse 14, and also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. So they're trying to reduce God to a formula. Bad idea. You ever see people do that? Sow a seed to my ministry. Gosh, turn on the television, you'll see that kind of stuff in spades. It's just all over the place. And and essentially what it's doing is it's trying to obligate God to my formula. And when you look at that through redeemed eyes, you think, how foolish. But the world, again gets these weird ideas about what God's doing. Verse 15, And the evil spirit answered and said, and I love this, this is great. He says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And, and, and I, just, I just picture this, this guy, that he's oppressed by demons, he's and he goes, okay, time out, hold on a second. Who are you again? And it's essentially, these guys, they're trying to, to, to mimic the work that the Holy Spirit is doing through Paul. Verse 16, the man in whom the evil spirit, uh, in whom the evil spirit was, leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. All right. Ephesus is rolling along now. Um, God allows this guy that's manifesting demons, a demonic presence, and I mean there's a real serious aspect to this, folks. I mean, it's fun to think about it to look at, but the demonic realm is real. And we do well to understand that it's real. And greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. This is a scene. Essentially, what God is demonstrating through this is that the miracles of God are not parlor tricks. You got to take this seriously. Do miracles, signs and wonders happen? Absolutely, they happen. Absolutely. God is the author of physics, and every time that he wants to do a miracle, he just bends the laws of physics. That's all he, it's normal for him. We look at it and go, ooh, ah. But yes, but is there a purpose to the miracles? Absolutely. In Acts chapter 2, we're told that 
Peter, when he stands up on the day of Pentecost and begins to talk to the crowd through which 3,000 people get saved that day, he says, this man was attested to you. This man, Jesus, was attested to you through signs and wonders and miracles. The purpose of miracles is to validate the message. They're, they are never to be used as an end of themselves. These guys are trying to use them as an end of themselves, and it's not working. They have not had an encounter personally with Christ. Therefore, they have no real power. And so they're trying to kind of do this sideways deal, and it doesn't work. Interesting, too, who did the miracles? God did the miracles. And it validated the message of the gospel in these people in Ephesus. And it validates the message of the gospel in many, many, many people down through the ages since. I have seen miracles with my own eyes. I saw with my eight-year-old daughter, I saw her get, well, actually, I didn't see because I was out. But it got thrown out of a, a VW bus onto a state highway at 60 miles an hour. She didn't have a scratch. I know that God does miracles personally. And that validated the message for me, and that's part of my testimony of how I came to Christ. Verse 17, it said, This became known both to all the Jews and the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, built up, focused on, in the spotlight. That's what that means. That they were, these guys were accustomed to playing with games, with their little lowercase g gods. They had their trinkets, they had their little statues, they had all the stuff. But we know that there was no power, no real power in those. And they're seeing real power. They saw this demon-possessed guy leap on these other guys that were big shots. And, you know, known as, you know, sort of the, they were the guys that were doing all the stuff. And, and strip them naked, wound them to where they go running from the house. And word got out, you think? Yeah, word got out. And, and, and fear fell on all of them. And Jesus was lifted up. It was different because they saw the spiritual realm for what it is, not what they pretended it to be. Part of our job as believers to, is to introduce people to the spiritual realm as it is not as people pretend it to be. There's a lot of pretending going on out there, folks. And it behooves us as ambassadors for Christ to know the real deal and to be able to share that with authority, with a lost world. Verse 18, And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. They came confessing and telling their deeds? Yeah. Yeah. That is an aspect of true repentance. There is, an, uh, there is a humility that comes about with true repentance. It's like, I know what I have done. I know that it has been against God. I know that God wants my whole heart. And I am going to tell, and it doesn't mean that you're out there being naked with people. Being transparent, yes. But there's a place where God honors. This is, this, this is the fruit of repentance. It's clear. It doesn't, this verse, this passage doesn't use the word repentance, but repentance is happening. Repenting and believing is breaking out all over in Ephesus at this point. Verse 19, also many of those who had practiced magic and brought their, they brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. So the, these guys, they, they're convicted, man. I'll tell you, God is working in their hearts. They give their life to Christ and they're saying, you know, I know that you're the real God and this other stuff is garbage. This is trash. I know that the things I've been involved in and whether, and you know what, folks, I would love to see, and I believe it's part of the seedbed of transformation. It's part of the seedbed of revival in the church is, I, I, man, I, I, I'm getting rid of this pornography. I'm getting rid of these drugs. Recreational marijuana, are you serious? Come on. It's something that will conquer your will. And, and I'm not going to go there. My point is, is, is there is a point where you stand up for Christ and you say, you know what? No more. And these people are saying, no more. I've had an encounter with the true God. And he's touched my heart. He's touched my life. I'm going to speak it. 
and I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. It says that, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. You know how much that is? A piece of silver was about a day's wage. And, in, and a common laborer, this would be about five and a half million bucks worth of books and scrolls that they stood up for Christ, threw them on the fire, said, we're done. I want to follow Jesus. The people repented and it showed. They confessed their godless deeds. They renounced their godless lifestyle and it cost them. King David said, I'm not going to do anything for God unless it costs me. And folks, there's a cost to being a disciple. There's a cost to belonging to him. There's a cost to saying, I am a Christian. It doesn't mean that you've never done anything wrong, but it means that you take a stand. And you say, you know what? The world behind me, the cross before me, I'm not turning back. Verse 20, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. The, the Ephesian church exploded at this point. The people were coming in the droves. Big city, big work of God, Holy Spirit falling, people repenting, people getting right with God. And the church exploded. As a result of this great movement of God, the enemy kicked into high gear too. I'm not going to read it verse by verse, but there was a silversmith by the name of Demetrius. He manufactured silver shrines, little silver statues of the Temple of Diana. And, and, and he sold them. And so he gets with his buddies, other craftsmen, and, and they stir up this huge commotion in Ephesus. They actually start a riot because so many were coming to Christ that their business was starting to dry up. They like, wow, I'm losing my market here. Luke even writes here in Acts, he says that nearly all of Asia was being exposed to the gospel, that people were coming to Christ all over the region. So they started this riot in verse 29, I'm going to drop down there, and the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord. So the whole city gets stirred up with this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's also... Uh, some pushback coming from the, the powers of darkness here. They all go rushing into the theater, and you're thinking, this huge city, what, what do you mean? Well, the theater at Ephesus is huge. The slide here, uh, this, it's the largest theater in the ancient world. You could easily seat north of 25,000 people in this thing. It is a huge stadium, and it's called the Theater of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus doesn't exist as a city anymore, but there are some rich, rich, archaeology left behind, and this is part of it. This is the largest one, as I mentioned, in the ancient world. So God moved these people, the, the, says the whole city, went, they went rushing off to the theater, and, and this would hold about 10% of the city, but I would imagine it was full. And, and this guy, again, it's just amazing to me how God works. You'd think that this big flashy miracle had happened then. All right, you know, God's just going to, you know, this whole deal. No. The city clerk gets up there. The acoustics, by the way, are really, really good in this. And he stands up and he essentially quiets the crowd. And he says, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase, he says, if you guys have a beat, these guys aren't destroying your temple. They're not doing illegal stuff. And if you have a beef with them, we have courts. And you can take it to the pro council and you can adjudicate this. You don't have to stir up this. And everybody kind of went, oh, okay. And they went home. <laughs> it was like, that's it? No, that's it. That's really, that's, it was so anticlimactic the way that it happened that Paul, it says as soon as the people settled down, he moved westward. He went on into Macedonia, which is northern Greece. And then on chapter tw in chapter 20, uh, of Acts. I'm not going to read from there, but uh, it, it basically it deals with his return trip. He goes on through on this third missionary journey that he's on, and he visits these other churches. He ends up back at Corinth, and then from Corinth, he needs to head for Jerusalem, but he wants to go and say goodbye to the elders of the church of Ephesus. So he meets them at a place called Miletus, which is a seaport a few miles to the south of Ephesus. He doesn't want to go all the way into town. And yet, 
very touching passage. I would encourage you to read it in, in Acts 20, where they weep, man. They weep together, and they just, it says they fall on each other's necks. In other words, they're just, these guys had been in the trenches together. I was talking to somebody this week and about when you're serving the Lord together with other people, you tend to form deep bonds. And that's true. These guys had formed some very deep bonds. They had been in the trenches. Man, they had been up against the powers of darkness together. They had seen the birth of this church far beyond anything anybody could have imagined. And God was using them powerfully. Like I said, Timothy would be called back to Ephesus. Paul would move on to Macedonia. He would go on around. Then he would meet with the Ephesian elders there. And he said, the reason why I'm saying goodbye to you is the Holy Spirit has told me that chains and tribulation await me when I get back to Jerusalem. He was right. He left Miletus, sailed back to Israel, went to Jerusalem, and you can read in Acts uh, 21 and following what happened to him. He got arrested he ended up being taken down to Caesarea Maritima where he would be imprisoned there for a couple of years. And then essentially he would be taken back to Rome. When he was convicted, uh, well, they were, they were talking about convicting him of, of the things. He, and, and with the charges that were against him, he as a Roman citizen said, I appeal to Rome. And the guys that were trying him said he could have gotten off. But since he appealed to Rome, we have to send him now. And so he ends up going back to Rome being chained to a Roman guard. And during that time, he writes a letter fondly back to this church at Ephesus. And that's the book of Ephesians. Ending where we started, that's how it came about. It's really important to me to be able to lay the groundwork for this book. Now you can understand the background of how these things came about. The book of Ephesians is an interesting book because there's no correction in it. He's not writing to say, hey man, you guys are really blowing it here. Like he does 1 Corinthians. Oh my gosh, that's a whole book of you're blowing it. It, it. Which is great because it's for our correction, for our instruction. But this is so, it's very tenderly written. There's a lot of prayer. There's a, Paul, as he's writing, he just breaks into worship. He just praises as he goes through. Uh, wonderful, wonderful treatise on what it is to belong to Christ. And he's got such a burden now. I see, I, I picture him chained to this garden, thinking back to his time at Ephesus and the whole thing with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the school of Tyrannus and, and the things that we experienced together. And, and here, you know, when I was at Corinth, I saw Apollos, he's doing well. And, you know, Timothy, I got to write to Timothy. Oh yeah, he's there. He's got some problems there at Ephesus. He needs to get more of a backbone with the people and being a leader and, and all of that. I mean, he, I just picture him there in that place. And as he begins to write these letters and send them out, we get the benefit. That's what the world would look like for the Ephesian church. The broader context of the book of Ephesians what I wanted to go through this morning so that we could kind of look and step back and look at how it came about, how it comes to us. And essentially, five years after Paul left and he sailed for Jerusalem, he's there in Rome, chained to a guy, and he writes this letter back, thinking fondly of the people that he had had the privilege of being used of God to start this church and then to see it flourish. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, just such a brief look at these events.